All right, what is good, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my name is Mr. Little, and today we're going to do something I haven't done in a while, which is we're actually going to have a lecture. See, I got a request from some students to talk about the Silk Road, specifically for AP World Unit 2. But then I thought, you know what, I'm going to do what I always do, which is go way too big for my own good. So we're going to talk about the Silk Road in a grand overview, a gigantic overview. So get ready. I hope you're ready to take a big old journey through the history of the Silk Road. All right, so touching base on what it is that the College Board does actually want you to know if you're taking AP World about the Silk Road. They basically have three things they want you to be very familiar with. One would be more trade and more cities. Two would be commercial technologies. And three would be luxury and manufactured goods. Providing examples of these and being able to explain an example or two of these would put you in a really good position. So keep that in mind. So we're gonna have three learning objectives as we go through this particular presentation. And there is a sheet located in the description of this video. You can click on that, make a copy of it for yourself and then fill it in, uh, type it, print it, whatever you wanna do with it, just as a way to keep track of some of the things you're gonna see in here. Because this presentation is gonna be really long to please um, take little notes when you hear things that you think would help. So check in the description for that. This is learning objective number one, how to improve commercial practices, increase the volume of trade and promote the growth of new trading cities. Objective number two, how is the trade in luxury goods encouraged by innovations in existing transportation, commercial, or other technologies? Learning objective number three, how did the increase in demand for luxury goods result in an increase and an intensification in production across Eurasia, that is Europe and Asia? So those are our three learning objectives. As we go through this particular lecture, please look for things that could help you answer those particular questions, okay? All right, before we dive in and talk about the Silk Road, I want to give you a visual of the Silk Road. Since we're not gonna be looking at too many maps, I wanna give you an idea of where everything kind of is right now before we jump in and talk about all the nitty gritty and the details. So the first thing to know about the Silk Road is that more than anything else, it's a network of roads. It's not a single road running from like Chang'an all the way to Constantinople. It's a network of roads, right? There's a northern route, there's a central route, there's a southern route, right? There are many different roads in the Silk Road. And so it's important to understand that it's a network and that it runs from, roughly speaking, Asia. Um, it might end in Korea, it might end in Japan, depending on how you define it, all the way to Europe. Now it might end in Constantinople. Some maps have it going all the way to Rome. Other maps have it stop in the Middle East, sometimes around Cairo, sometimes Damascus. Uh, it just depends. Every map's going to be a little bit different. But the point is, it's a series of networks and it runs from uh, in Asia, East Asia, all the way over uh, to Europe and or the Middle East. Okay, this is a slightly more detailed map uh, that kind of gives you all the nodes, all the major nodes in the system. Now, notice that it, the ones in red are considered the major routes. The ones in lighter red and uh, gray are considered not necessarily part of the Silk Road. So notice, by the way, that the Silk Road does sort of dip into India, but usually isn't considered like the primary Silk Road. Now, I think that's a little unfair. I think it's kind of like cutting India out of world history. But to be fair, India does have the Indian Ocean trade network. So, uh, but in general, right, there are major nodes in China and the east, and there are major nodes up to Constantinople and Egypt uh, in the west. And in between, there are dozens, if not hundreds of cities that are famous and known for their Silk Road fame. Now, notice the geography. Okay, so the, the nodes aren't on this one. But if you look over here, this is kind of where things end over here. This is where the western end of it is. And over here we have Beijing, and this is kind of where the eastern end of it is. Between Beijing and Constantinople or Trebizond, as you can see here, uh, for the most part, you have mountains, 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 some valleys here, uh, more mountains, more mountains, a big plateau, which has a lot of mountains, a desert, an even bigger desert. Right, uh, some more mountains over here, and then uh, a couple of valleys, but this is like steppe area, so this is sort of the Central Asian steppe. And the Aral Sea, which doesn't really exist much anymore, fun fact, uh, or maybe not so fun fact, okay? Uh, but that, that what this means is that when you look at things like this and you see all these nodes and where they run, it's really important to note that, for example, this node up here, this corresponds with the passage around the Taklamakan Desert, kind of around the edge of the Taklamakan Desert, because you don't want to go through it if you can avoid it. There is a route that goes through it, uh, but if you could kind of avoid it, that would have been an ideal situation. So these networks are also shaped by geography, whether that's the Taklamakan Desert, the Gobi Desert, the Tibetan Plateau, the Hindu Kush Mountains, the Pamirs, or the mountains uh, of Iran and the steppes of Central Asia. Geography really does help shape the Silk Road. It shapes the kind of animals, it shapes the kind of locations of particular nodes and routes, and what it is that cities produce along the way. And we're going to talk more about that. But just an idea to understand is that 
geography plays a big part in the Silk Road. Notice, by the way, this is kind of a simplified Silk Road. Notice that the Silk Road always seems to be connected in some way to a political state. In this case, this is the early Silk Road, the time of the Roman Empire. So this is around 100 CE. And notice that the Silk Road runs through a number of kingdoms, through Persia, through the Kushan Empire, which is like a North Indian Silk Road Empire, and then over into the Han Dynasty in China. So the Silk Road is in part made possible because of the work of political states, but also political states really like to take advantage of it. So you'll always find maybe empires or as small as city states trying to take control or have like nodes of the Silk Road run through them. And so that's something you'll notice here is that the Silk Road always is connected to an empire of some sort. And most famously, probably you're aware of the Mongol Empire of the 13th century, uh, which famously brought most of the Silk Road, if not all of it, underneath their control, stretching from China all the way out to Constantinople, uh, not conquering Constantinople, but getting nearby uh, in the West. So just notice the empires of the Silk Road. Uh, here's a map of some of the major Silk Road cities. Now, I know there are no lines here, but just in the West, uh, the Silk, major Silk Road cities where goods from the Silk Road might have come might be Cairo and Constantinople. And in the East, you have uh, Beijing under the Ming Dynasty, Kaifeng under the Song Dynasty, Chang'an under the Tang Dynasty. Uh, basically, any capital of a Chinese dynasty would be a big end of the Silk Road node. Where does it start and where does it end? As I've kind of said, this is sort of up for debate. A lot of Western scholars, however, would say that the the Silk Road probably ended at Constantinople, which you can see here, famous for its walls around the city. As for where it ends in the east, this is also a little bit more complex, whereas most scholars would say probably China, somewhere in China, maybe a port city in China or the capital of the Chinese dynasties. I did talk to some scholars and went and visited a place, see Gokoram, uh, which is the which is a Buddhist cave. Um, and Buddhist caves were known to be stopping points for merchants. And this is the last Buddhist cave that they found going east. So there's a case to be made that the Silk Road might actually end in Korea. But either way, just kind of knowing this starts in the West, quote unquote, and that would be like Europe and the Middle East, and then kind of goes through Central Asia, goes through parts of South Asia, and then ends in the East, right, in China, may maybe uh, Korea, somewhere right there. It's just always good to keep in mind. All right, so how is this presentation going to go? Well, I'm going to use a thematic approach. We're going to use the AP World themes known as Spice Tea, because we're going to be covering up to about 1700. This is up to Unit 4. And so in or instead of having one gigantic timeline, we're just going to take a thematic approach. Um, but this means you should keep one of those maps handy uh, and be prepared to reference different places at different times. And this is definitely going to have parts of the course that are not from Unit 2. So do keep your eyes and your ears open for that, things that might come up after Unit 2, so after 1450. So something to keep your eyes peeled for. All right, let's talk really quick about the origins of the Silk Road. Like, where does the Silk Road come from? Um, a few things to keep in mind, sort of general rules, is that it's a, it is roads, not a single road. There were many, 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 many different trade goods traded on it. We usually think of silk, but it had so many different goods. You could have called it any number of roads. Porcelain Road, the Lapis Lazuli Road. Um, there's just so many different things you could have called it. Uh, silk is just one of many goods that were traded on it. It was very heavily used right up until the 1700s. So we sometimes tend to think it kind of disappeared after the voyages of exploration, but it's not entirely true. And one thing to always keep in mind, though, if you're comparing it to uh, things like the Indian Ocean Basin is that um, the Indian Ocean trade, it's almost always uh, larger than the Silk Road trade, simply because overland trade is more energy energy inefficient and can be more dangerous than seaborne trade. So just something to keep in mind. So why is it called the Silk Road, though, if so many things were traded on it and not just silk? Well, funny story, uh, this guy named Baron Ferdinand von Richthofen, who was a geologist in the 19th century, uh, studied Roman trade with the East. And by that, he meant like Roman trade with China and Roman trade with what is now India. And he was really obsessed with silk. And so when he sort of formulated this idea of like a trade network that ran from China all the way to Rome, and he wasn't he wasn't the first person to think of this, uh, but he was the one to popularize it. He, because he was so focused on silk, named it the Seidenstrasse. And the Seidenstrasse literally means like Silk Street or Silk Way. And so in English, we call this the Silk Road. And that's kind of just where the name comes from. If you're really curious, it's from one German guy who really liked to study uh, Roman trade, particularly in silk. So let's talk about like, early trade, which could be considered like precursors to the Silk Road. So we know that humans in parts of Asia, Africa, and Europe have been trading for a very long time. 
We know this because, for example, in the Indus Valley, which is what's now Afghanistan and Pakistan, they had a very precious blue stone there called lapis lazuli. Archaeologists have found this stone in places like ancient Egypt. So clearly it had to get from the Indus Valley all the way to ancient Egypt, a distance of, I would guess off the top of my head, like uh, 1500 miles. So clearly humans have been trading for a long time. Also, something to note about Central Asia is that is where horses domesticated uh, brought various nomadic groups into contact with some of these early societies. And these horses, which were not uh, domestic to a lot of these early settled societies, were then highly in demand by these settled societies. And so this is one of the origins of the trade between nomadic peoples and settled peoples was, in fact, the demand for horses, uh, the desire to have these powerful beasts of burden that you could ride or do farm work with. Right now, there is a classical origin story of the Silk Road that that some historians, including the textbook that I use, kind of uses the the origin story of the Silk Road, which is that the Han Dynasty in China uh, really wanted access to Central Asian horses as well as jade and cotton, and so they sent out military expeditions into the Tar Basin in what is now the Taklamakan Desert and that general area, and created all these military outposts to protect that region. And then eventually, because the soldiers didn't actually have to do that much, they created little towns and people came out and settled down there, and eventually you sort of open up this connection with Central Asia, which then opens up a connection with uh, the Mediterranean or Western world, which had been itself sort of expanded eastward by the conquests of Alexander the Great. So that's kind of the classical story, if you will, of how the Silk Road becomes. It's sort of an east going west and a west going east thing. However, it's, as usual, a little more complicated than that. And there were many different origin points and different points of beginning on the Silk Road. So for example, there was the Persian Royal Road that was built before Alexander the Great did his conquest, and that linked what is now Turkey all the way with what is now uh, Iran. And that's a little bit of a, not that much, it's just like one small portion of a broader network. But when counted with other uh, contributions, such as the Hellenistic trade networks after Alexander the Great, as well as the roads of the uh, king of the Mauryan Empire, Ashoka Maurya, who we know he ordered roads to be built via his edicts, and the pillars of Ashoka, as well as other smaller networks that just sort of get bound into the larger ones, such as the Tea and Horse Road, which you can see on the left, which was a local trade network that developed between China and what is now Bangladesh, uh, that kind of went over the Tibetan mountains to trade specifically what else, tea and horses. So the Silk Road, although it has sort of a starting point or starting origin story, uh, either incorporated or also grew out of many different existing trade networks to form the network that we know today. So it's important to keep that in mind. All right, let's take a look at our themes. Let's start with the social. So when it comes to social structures and social classes on the Silk Roads, uh, probably the one that we probably should touch on the most would be the nomads. Now, nomadic people refers to groups of people that live in regions that are not necessarily great for farming. And while nomads once dominated most of the earth, uh, gradually the expansion of farming kind of pushed them out into areas where uh, farming wasn't great, and therefore places like steppes and deserts are where nomads came to predominate. Now, nomads uh, are different from settled agricultural societies, namely that they move around all the time, but also because of their focus on survival and not necessarily uh, the accumulation of material goods, uh, they're definitely more egalitarian, as well as more focused on merit and ability. This is where we'll get the Mongol form of government called a Khanate. They're also centered on kinship ties. That is, family and the clan, which is like a group of families, are more important than any sort of concept of a nation or an empire. Could be centered around like a herd of animals. Uh, maybe horses, maybe cows, maybe um, camels, something along those lines, but nomads played a really big part in the Silk Road. Now, nomadic peoples and settled peoples have a very mixed relationship, right? On the one hand, uh, there was a lot of trade that went on. Nomadic peoples could supply horses or horse products, furs, animal skins. And on the other side of that, nomads would demand manufactured goods, steel and iron, as well as other objects. Now, nomads also could serve as mercenaries. Uh, settled states tended to hire them as armed forces to protect their leaders or protect them from other nomads. Um, but occasionally, nomads would get violent with settled peoples, especially as settled peoples expanded into their realm. And so you see throughout history, nomadic confederacies, which are collections of large numbers of nomads, coming together to fight settled peoples, such as the Xiongnu, the Huns, the Gokturks, and of course, most famously, 
you've got the Mongols, right? So nomadic empires aren't anything new. The Mongols just happen to be the ones that we know the best and know the most about, right? You have Mongol emperors who then conquered settled peoples and bring them into some sort of administrative realm. In addition to nomads as a very important social class on the Silk Road, let's talk about merchants. Now, you might be wondering, who were the first merchants? And the answer is they were probably those nomads we were just talking about. Pastoral nomads with their knowledge of the complex geography, their ways of getting through dangerous geographic areas like deserts and high mountain ranges, allowed them to make these super long journeys and encourage contact between different groups of people. It's entirely possible that nomads were the ones that made the connection between the Indus Valley and ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia. But other famous merchant groups on the Silk Road include groups known as Sogdians, which are uh, spoke a language that's closely related to Persian, uh, as well as people of the Jewish diaspora who settled along the Silk Road following the destruction of the temple, the hands of the Romans, as well as the Turkic peoples that lived out in Central Asia and the Uyghurs who lived in what is now Western China. Uh, these groups that lived along the Silk Road and because they had connections in many different places could often serve very effectively as merchants. Now, merchants were treated differently, sort of depending on where you were. So for example, the Roman Empire and most of the Chinese dynasties tended to kind of frown on merchants. They didn't like merchants. They, merchants were viewed as sly or slick, you know, because they got rich uh, from just moving things around and not actually doing what traditional concepts of work. Whereas places like uh, South and Southeast Asia were known to favor merchants, encourage them. Merchants had even become rulers in some of these places. The Mongols and their descendants most famously promoted merchants protected trade, and we'll talk more about that, as well as Islam in particular gave a great deal of religious sanction to merchants. And this might have been in part because the prophet of Islam himself had been a merchant prior to his revelations. So, you know, again, depending on where you were along the Silk Road within these networks, uh, merchants could be smiled upon, frowned upon, maybe ignored, uh, or treated very well, just kind of depending on where you were. So, for example, I like this quote from the Mauryan Empire, uh, basically saying that merchants will be given a certain amount of profit. Merchants could guarantee this kind of profit no matter where they came from or, or who they were. So there's definitely a strand of uh, political rulers that really liked merchants. Now, of course, one other thing to talk about the Silk Road and its contribution to wider history uh, would be the, the status of slaves and slavery. We don't tend to think of the Silk Road as like a slave trade network. Uh, we normally associate that with, for example, the Trans-Saharan slave trade or the slave trade of the Atlantic. But the Silk Road, like any other, provided slaves for those who were doing business. Uh, because slaves were a luxury good. If you could afford to employ and own another human being, that was a luxury good people would pay a lot of money for. So prisoners of war, prisoners of raids by nomads would often be sold to slaves. Turkic slaves, in particular, particular, uh, were highly prized during the, the first millennia up until about the 1400s. And of course, those Turkic slaves, many of them went on to become rulers in their own right, because, you know, kidnapping someone, keeping them as a slave, teaching them how to use weapons was definitely always a good idea. Uh, and those Turkic slaves would have a great impact on the Islamic world, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. Um, but slaves from South Asia also remained really popular uh, in Central Asia. It's actually really interesting, because it, it, as Islam became more prevalent in Central Asia, there is a rule in Islam that you can't enslave your fellow Muslims. Muslims. Um, and so they needed a source of people they could potentially enslave that were not Muslims. And so there's been a lot of scholarship exploring how the slave trade from South Asia, what is now uh, Pakistan and India and Bangladesh, uh, found their way into Central Asia. This trade operated from around the 1200s, kind of right up into the 1800s. So slavery was a factor on the Silk Road, uh, in part because slaves were a luxury good. Not We don't think of it that way, but that is how the elites probably saw it. All right, let's shift over and talk politics. So as you've probably learned, if you're taking a world history class, then you've probably heard all about how states promoted trade, states sponsored trade, states protected trade. And this is absolutely true, right? Now, you might ask, why? Why do states like trade so much? And the answer is very simple. Trade brings money. If you have trade, then people can buy or sell more goods, which means your citizens might get richer, and therefore you could tax them more, and therefore you might get more powerful, right? So it's, it's very simple. States like to do it because you potentially get tax money. And so states would do things like give tax credits or give merchants special autonomy, like their own communities. Chinese cities famously would have whole neighborhoods dedicated to specific merchant groups with their own rules and their own laws. The later gunpowder empires, like the Ottomans and the Safavids, would build extensive networks of caravanserais, that is, places like the one you see here on the right, this one's in Egypt, but where merchants could rest their pack animals and have a safe place to stay for the night, either not free of charge, but usually at a heavily discounted rate. And of course, you might have heard of the Mongol yam system, which was a postal system, but merchants were allowed to use it, and this made doing business easier and safer. And so states have a long, long history of promoting trade uh, in order to get, to get more money, of course, because that's what states like to do. It's expensive to run a state. You need tax money. 
Now, this also raises an interesting question of like, do states always promote trade? And the answer is not always. But one thing that states still like to do is tax merchants. Like states are happy to tax merchants, even if the leaders of these states, the political leaders of the states, don't really like trade. And this is something we still see a lot today. Politicians who might rail against free trade or say that it's uh, evil or, or bad for the country still don't mind potentially taxing. The Roman Empire and like Ming China both disdained merchants, but were happy to continue to tax them and let them do their business. Even places that like ostensibly promote trade, like the Song Dynasty, uh, we give the Song Dynasty of China a lot of credit because it had what we might consider the first market economy. But that market economy is really more attributable to non-government features like a population boom and technological innovation than it is to say government intervention. In fact, if anything, that market economy kind of came about because the Song Dynasty, unlike its predecessors, didn't add on additional monopolies on resources that their predecessors had had. So, you know, the question of states promoting trade, states sometimes do take direct action to promote trade, but even states that don't prefer to promote trade still don't mind taxing it uh, very heavily sometimes. And of course, sometimes the elites of societies don't like trade either. So one of these famous uh, examples of this would be Pliny the Elder, uh, who was a Roman uh, philosopher, and he talked about how they gave away all their silver for uh, for incense. And what do we do with incense? We just burn it. We might as well just be burning our own silver. This is ridiculous. Um, and there was a ban on silk in Rome for a little while because the emperor thought that silk was ruining the morality of the Roman people, although he was probably also concerned about the amount of gold and silver leaving the Roman world and heading east to buy more silk. So elites do like exotic goods and luxury goods, uh, but there are phases in history in certain places where elites don't like luxury goods and attempt to sort of disparage trade or disparage merchants. So where do trading cities come from? Where do these big, independent, powerful trading cities come from? Well, usually they are a result of urbanization. That is, periods of human history where urban population centers grow and explode at very high rates. But even then, these urban centers usually had existed before. They just uh, did something else. So for example, they might have been a series of monasteries. They might have been a, a single caravanserai or a military post, such as Kashgar. And they might have been known for the production of one very particular good, such as Samarkand, which was known to produce silk outside of China, uh, that eventually bloomed into a trading city that produced many different things. And you can see Xuanzang, the Buddhist monk's account of uh, Samarkand here. So trading cities grow as a result of urbanization, but urbanization contributes to uh, the production of more goods, which continues to grow the trading city. And so that's kind of a uh, positive feedback loop. Now, the, 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 the feedback loop breaks when there's a sudden shift in the city's fortunes, such as, I don't know, a gigantic plague that ravages a trade route or massive conquest that destabilizes the whole area both of which happened in the 1300s and the 1400s, and we'll talk about those later. But these cities, uh, the nice thing about trading cities is that in addition to just being the center where trade was done, uh, many cities gained reputations for other features too, and these would have consequences for uh, greater human history, such as Baghdad, which was initially an administrative city for the Abbasid Caliph, but then eventually became a center of learning and wisdom in addition to a large trade city. Uh, we also have diaspora communities which pop up in major, major cities, as I mentioned earlier. So Hangzhou in China, uh, famously had a neighborhood for each of its diaspora communities. These neighborhoods helped spread the word about these particular trading cities. And so uh, trading cities uh, may have begun as trade or they might have begun as something else, but even when they grew into new larger cities, uh, usually it had other larger effects on world history. Now, of course, we can't talk about politics and the Silk Road without talking about the Mongols. Everybody loves the Mongols. They're everybody's favorite mass murderers, you know? The Mongols were these nomads that lived north of China and under Genghis Khan in the 1200s, they built an empire that extended about halfway across Asia, and then Genghis Khan's successors added China and parts of the Middle East and parts of what is now Russia to this large empire. How does this large empire uh, affect history uh, as it relates to the Silk Road? Well, the Silk Road helped keep uh, the empire together at first, and then after the empire itself splintered, it helped keep the different parts of the empire in contact with each other. Uh, this Mongol empire utilized uh, foreign administrators to help it manage and run the empire. So for example, the part of the Mongol empire that was in Russia, which is called the Golden Horde. The Golden Horde was known to have Chinese administrators, uh, as well as uh, Persians in the Yuan Dynasty that's in China. They also adopted the Uyghur script, uh, which you can see right here. Uh, and this is a kind of, this is a script that was being used by the people of what is now Western China.
China because the Mongols didn't have a script at the time. So they just borrowed this one to help them run the empire. So in the act of running the Mongol empire, uh, they spread and diffused culture throughout Asia. And this was in part made possible by the fact that their empire literally straddled the Silk Road. Now, there's also a term you might know called the Pax Mongolica or the Mongol peace, the idea that because these uh, the Mongol empire united most of the Silk Road under one administration, uh, this meant the trade could flourish and bloom and be awesome. Now, this is a little bit questionable only because like almost immediately after the death of Genghis Khan's grandson, uh, the Khanates were like at war with one another. So I don't, you know, this may be a bit of an overblown concept, but all the same, at least for a little while, uh, the Silk Road was probably made safer, as well as that famous yam system, which is sort of a postage mail route I mentioned, which this is a letter that I sent on the yam system. And this this made it possible for merchants to move much quicker and much faster all along the Silk Road. So uh, the Mongol Empire, via its administration and unification of this trade route, made a trade possible and the spread of culture possible. Now, the Mongols favored merchants. Uh, this is known, and this is probably probably in part because they themselves being nomadic had an understanding of the difficulties of conducting trade and probably the fact that many merchants themselves were probably Mongols. Uh, they gave them preferential tax breaks. Several Italian merchant handbooks of the uh, early 1400s talk about how the Golden Horde would give preferential tax breaks to merchants. And especially in China, where previous dynasties, because they kind of looked down on merchants, had sometimes been known to just summarily confiscate all of a merchant's wealth. Under the Yuan dynasty, they actually got this new property protection that they couldn't just have their wealth uh, stripped away from them whenever the, the government kind of felt like it. There was also a merchant association the Mongols set up. I believe it's called an Ortog. Yeah. This was a merchant association designed to lend money to merchants at low interest rates, assist with the acquisition of pack animals to conduct caravans, and allow merchants to use the Yam postal system, uh, if they were a member of this. And the goal of Mongol rulers was to use the Silk Road to unify the empire economically. Trade between regions could kind of link them closer together. Unfortunately, the Mongols themselves were always such a small minority ruling over many millions of different peoples that eventually they sort of assimilated into the societies that they were ruling over and the empire itself fragmented. And so while that goal may have never been realized, the Mongol empire did, at least for a short time, unify the Silk Road and promote trade and, and the spread of culture throughout their empire, short-lived though it might have been. There were successors to the Mongols, such as the Timurids, under the famous conqueror Amir Timur, who built a smaller Central Asian nomadic empire, mostly consisting of Persia and parts of Central Asia. But he took pains to redirect trade to his capital at Samarkand. And just like the Mongols before him, he also, whenever he won a battle, captured a city, or defeated a large army, he would look for artisans and skilled workers to bring to his capital. And in his capital, he would build major works of art, such as the Bibi Kayanid Mosque, which is built here, which this is just an absolutely massive edifice. The thing about Tamerlane uh, is that most of the, the buildings he ordered to be constructed by all these artisans uh, don't exist because they were so large that the minute the smallest earthquake happened, they almost just always fell over. So we have lots of descriptions of Tamerlane trying to build his capital of Samarkand, some of the largest buildings around, uh, but they almost always uh, kind of just fell over the minute they were done because they were just so massive they couldn't support their own weight. You know, there are other nomadic empires that have also attempted to control trade on the Silk Road, and so the conquests of Tamerlane were in part to do that. But even after the existing empires no longer were attempting to control the entire Silk Road, uh, even their successors, the gunpowder empires, that's the Ottomans, Mughals, and Safavids, also attempted to profit from the Silk Road. Now, by this time, uh, the late mid-1500s, the Ming Dynasty, which had uh, succeeded the Yuan Dynasty in China, had sort of begun to close itself off a little bit from international trade. To say they were completely closed off would be a misnomer, but nonetheless, trade did slow down between Central Asia and China. And so the Silk Road was kind of uh, restricted to the Middle East and parts of Central Asia. But the gunpowder empires continued to try to profit from it. And so, for example, Shah Abbas of Persia renovated the city of Isfahan in 1598 and built one of the world's largest markets. It's either two miles long or two kilometers long. I know that's a big difference. You can see it here in this picture. It's kind of snaking its way through the city uh, and next to a gigantic square that people could gather in. And the Ottoman Empire built a huge network of caravans arise throughout their empire. So even as late into the 1600s and the 1700s, empires are still trying to work with merchants and gain some profit from the Silk Road. Okay, let's talk about environmental interactions, aka the ecological stuff. 
So one of the things to understand uh, about sort of the relationship between settled peoples and nomads, one of my favorite and most interesting uh, facts is that uh, geography is often been associated with civilization. And it was true with the societies on the Silk Road. So for example, in ancient China, pre-Han dynasty, pre-Qin dynasty, nomads were perceived as barbarians. Uh, nomads are barbarians because they don't cultivate. They don't farm things. They just stay out with their horses all day. And uh, that was what made a barbarian. So throughout history, even though nomads played a huge role in the Silk Road, uh, nomads have often been looked down upon or at least disparaged to some extent, in part because they clash with the settled, civilized perception of farming as civilization. So it's worth noting, however, that the domestic animals that were going to play such a huge part of the Silk Road were domesticated in Central Asia, right? The horse was domesticated somewhere on the Silk Road or in the territory that would, would later be part of the Silk Road around 3500 BCE. Uh, where exactly is a mystery? It's hard to say. Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan argue about whose country gets to claim the legacy for horse domestication because scholars think it happened somewhere in that general area. Uh, it, but the demand for horses, not just horses themselves, the demand for horses in China and South Asia uh, was a major incentive to start trading early on. And horses, by the fact that they are massive animals, I don't know if you've stood next to a horse recently, but they are huge, they're scary, they're full of muscle, they can gallop of speeds exceeding 30 miles an hour. That's pretty insane. So this, uh, the, the ability to use horses in part gave rise to all those nomadic empires we talked about. So the domestication of the horse and its role in trade and empire building on the Silk Road is something really worth keeping in mind. Uh, the same thing with the Bactrian camel, that is the camel with the two humps. That's how you know you're looking at a Bactrian camel. The one humped camel is the dromedary, and that one is from somewhere in Southern Arabia and or East Africa. Uh, these were domesticated about a thousand years after the horse. Uh, and Bactrian camels were a really big feature on the Silk Road in part because they were just a workhorse, pardon the pun. Uh, they could carry 600 pounds, they could travel up to 30 kilometers a day, and and what's even more important, they could go into the high mountains, such as the Pamirs or the Hindu Kush, and they could operate in fairly warm, although not scorching hot temperatures. And the thing about uh, Bactrian camels is that in early Chinese artwork, uh, Bactrian camels are almost always depicted with Sogdians. Uh, Sogdians were those uh, Persian-speaking uh, peoples I talked about earlier being one of the primary merchants. So especially in Chinese art, there's a very big connection between the Bactrian camel and foreign merchants. So this, this camel has been a part of Silk Road trade for quite some time. Um, there's also the spread of food. This is a big one for AP World and uh, that you need to know where certain foods went in certain places. And so why would food spread along a trade route? Well, merchants do carry food with them. Sometimes if a food comes to a place, it just sticks. Uh, but sometimes food begins as medicine and then it becomes just really, really popular. And so people want to uh, keep using it for other things. So tea is a great example of this. In Persia, tea began as sort of a medicine and then it gradually just became something you drank all the time. Same thing with citrus. When citrus came to Europe, from the Middle East, it started off as a medicine, but then eventually it sort of developed into something we eat every day. So oranges or lemon in your drink. And so that's how food can become more popularized. It starts out as a small exotic thing on a trade route and then becomes normal everyday food. You also have elites demanding exotic foods as powerful or, or luxury symbols, right? Look at me, I'm wealthy because I can eat sugar or I'm wealthy because I can put almonds and pistachios in my food, right? So things that, again, we would today consider pretty bland or normal uh, were considered exotic and therefore symbols of either maybe your wealth or your power. Uh, and that's why these things could spread on the Silk Road because they would be demanded by the elites the same way that they might demand slaves or they might demand precious stones. Uh, food was much in the same way. One of my final favorite examples of how food spreads on the Silk Road was that the Mongol rulers in different parts of Asia, uh, whether it's in what is now Iran, what is now uh, Russia, and what is now China, uh, they had professional chefs known as, I believe this is pronounced butter cheese, and this uh, formalized a lot of this food diffusion because Mongol rulers would want to eat foods from other parts of the empire, and so the, their chefs would perfect these recipes and sort of formalize them and pass them down in new areas, and so that's how you get some distribution of food that you may not have had previously, and this right here is a uh, a guide for growing sugar written in Arabic. Sugar actually originates somewhere in Southeast Asia, where it then comes uh, to what is now India, then it goes to the Middle East, then it goes to Europe, and then most famously, it goes to the New World. Uh, but we'll talk more about that at some other point. I've also made a video about that before. Now, of course, there's also germs, and this is uh, the other famous thing that's spread on the Silk Road, would be uh, plagues and germs. Because when people move, 
germs move. And when more people move and more goods move, then more germs move. And while this has played out uh, historically for centuries on a small scale, only beginning in around the uh, fifth century CE does it begin to play out on a large scale uh, with the plague of Justinian, which ravaged not only the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, but it also ravaged the Persian Empire because there was a good deal of cross-border trade between Persia and Rome and their neighbor Armenia. And so this plague ravaged both empires and killed uh, perhaps millions of people. But the most famous one, and the one you probably would have to know about, would be the Black Death, also known as the Bubonic Plague, uh, which was a bacterial infection called, believed to be caused by what is now Yersinia's pestis. And it ravaged Afro-Eurasia. It killed perhaps 75 million people, perhaps a third of Europe, the 30%. And it is notably, as far as we know, the only time in written history where the population of the entire Earth has actually gone down. Uh, it was that deadly. Uh, and this is in part because the, the Mongol Empire and the Silk Road made it possible for a disease to travel far beyond its limits. And I think we're also seeing, you know, because I'm recording this in 2021 and we've been living through and are still living through uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we know that an interconnected world can create pandemics that even if we eventually get them under control uh, are going to make our lives very difficult for a little while. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, and then of course the, the impacts of the Black Death are many and, and probably deserve a video of their own, but um, the fact that, th that it has the impact that it has is in part attributable to the Silk Road. Um, so here's a map of the places where the Black Death is believed to have begun. It's not entirely known where it began. Some people think it began in the Tian Shan mountain range here. Some people think it began in the Tibetan Plateau. Some people think it began in what is now like Southern China and Nepal. Uh, no one really knows, though. It's kind of debated. But what we do know from the sources is that places where there were major trade routes often became major outbreak points. So in parts of uh, Arabia, and this is also indicate that places of major religious congregation uh, becomes uh, places of spread. So notice the connection between trade routes and the spread of the plague. All right, let's talk a little bit about culture culture. We're working our way through. We're about halfway through here. Stick with me. All right. So what is the most famous Silk Road spread? Well, probably religion. We want to talk about religion spreading on the Silk Road. It's a big deal. Um, so most famously, two of the early religions that uh, spread quite a bit along the Silk Road uh, would be, for example, Buddhism uh, in, in Asia and Christianity uh, in the West. But there were lots of other religions that also spread on the Silk Road even before those, such as Judaism and Zoroastrianism. But we'll talk more about those in a second. Why, though? We always have this question of why. Like, it's an accepted fact that religion spread on the Silk Road, but, but why? I mean, you don't normally think of trade when you think of religion. So let's let's have a look. Let's talk a little bit about this. And we're going to talk about these four religions right here. One would be simply that um, missionaries, those people who are actively intentionally going out to convert people to their religion, uh, usually follow the existing trade routes because that's the known way to get somewhere new. Uh, but sometimes they may not make it. Sometimes they might stop along the way. Sometimes they might make a convert along the way. And so this is why religion does tend to follow trade routes because missionaries and those seeking to spread the religion also tend to follow the trade routes. So it's believe that Thomas the Apostle uh, may have taken the overland route uh, when he went to India. He was one of the followers of Jesus of Nazareth, and he went to India shortly after the death of Jesus of Nazareth and created the uh, St. Thomas Christians, which is a community of Christians in India that continues to exist to this day. And did you know, although we don't consider China a Christian nation, that China actually had a bishop before England did? The city of Kashgar had a bishop uh, several hundred years before London had a bishop. So something to think about when we talk about the impact of trade routes on the spread of religions. There's also the standard political influence. And just as empires sought to control the Silk Road, uh, empires did like to sort of exert their influence over the religious pra practices of their subjects. So for example, the Kushan Empire, which dominated and straddled parts of the Silk Road, as well as the Tang Dynasty, which controlled much of the Silk Road right up to the Taklamakan Desert, both promoted Buddhism, and this helped to spread along the Silk Road, and the Islamic Caliphates and the various like sultanates uh, that succeeded them also promoted the spread of Islam. The Delhi Sultanate in particular helped spread Islam in a much more permanent fashion into what is now India. And of course, there's just economics, right? It's known that merchants would often give money to religious institutions in part because they would be promised some sort of eternal reward if they supported the institution. This most famously uh, occurs with uh, Buddhism, but it also occurs within Christianity and Islam. If rich merchants provide some wealth, they will be provided some sort of post-life eternal reward. And this uh, meant that a lot of temples gradually accumulated a great deal of wealth. Uh, this is part of the reason why the Tang Dynasty in China sought to suppress Buddhism, was in part this perception that Buddhism was becoming too financially powerful in China. But this increase in wealth led to religious institutions actually becoming like kind of pre-modern banks. A lot of temples, especially in South Asia and East Asia, Buddhist and Hindu temples, uh, were known to lend out money uh, in part 
to merchants and impart to other peoples. And so sometimes temples became some of the first banking institutions. And temples were viewed as safe, right? Who's going to attack a religious building? Who would do such a thing, right? It happened all the time, but at least the perception was there that no one was going to attack a religious building. And in Islam, there's a, there's another thing called, a, I believe it's called a waif. Uh, I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but the idea is that you would give money to an educational endowment. And that was the way you could keep some of your wealth in the family by setting up this educational endowment where you could stash your money uh, and save it from the prying taxation of the Sultan. Now, one of the interesting things about the appeal of religions on the Silk Road uh, is not just, as you can see here, the whole giving gifts uh, to the monastery will give you an eternal reward, as you can see all these merchants right here giving these gifts to the Buddha. Um, but there's this quote from Victor Lieberman's book about Buddhism in Southeast Asia, which I know is not on the Silk Road, but it really does kind of get at why it is that Buddhism in particular was so appealing, mainly because as universal religions, Buddhism and Islam and Christianity, as well as a lot of the other smaller ones, uh, weren't geographically restricted. And therefore, people could follow them no matter where they were, right? Whether they were at home, whether they were on the road, uh, they could be uh, followed. All you needed to do was find uh, your local temple, your local mosque, your local church, your local synagogue, and you could partake in the rituals of the religion. And therefore, for merchants, as well as for people moving around, maybe even soldiers, uh, there was a great incentive to follow a religion that was not geographically rooted in one place. And so that's part of the reason why these universal religions could spread along the Silk Road. Now, we talk about trade leading to the spread of religion religions, but it does go the other way too. Sometimes communities in cross-border regions uh, can connect with one another and promote trade. The most famous example of this though, however, is the monk Xuanzang, who went to visit India in the 7th century CE, uh, mainly because he wanted to learn more about Buddhism. Uh, at this time, Buddhism, while it wasn't new to China, it had been there for about 400 years, most Chinese monks felt like they just didn't know very much about the Buddha. And so you, for a period of about 300 years, you had all these Buddhist monks going to India to find uh, texts, relics, anything they could learn about Buddhism and then bringing it back to China. So as one author has pointed out, the, the relationship between China and South Asia, what is now like India, before 700 CE, it was mostly Buddhist related texts, scrolls, relics, you name it, incense for worship. After 700 CE, when China became a Buddhist center in its own right, and monks sort of stopped making the pilgrimage as often as they did, the trade became more economic, right? Things like silk, rhino horns, and pepper. And so this is an interesting case of religion actually leading to trade, not the other way around. I also want to talk about one really interesting religion that kind of epitomizes the Silk Road itself, and that's something called Manichaeanism. Now, Manichaeanism is, it was a short-lived religion, and by short-lived, I mean, a thousand years, um, but it was a dualistic religion, which means it saw the world as a battle between good and evil, and what you did in your life contributed to either the victory of the good or the victory of evil. And so this was very popular on the Silk Road in part because it was just so flexible, uh, and it basically took on the form of wherever it happens to be. Now, we don't know a lot about Manichaeanism. There's only a few small texts and some pictures that survived. However, there is one temple that made it, and that temple happens to be located in China. And I was lucky enough to go see it, and these are some photos from there. I didn't actually take these photos, but I did see this temple. Uh, and you can see that uh, this depiction right here looks like the Buddha, but this is actually the Manichaean prophet Mani. Uh, and it was so flexible, uh, Manichaeanism was so flexible that it pretty much just blended into whatever it happened to encounter. So in the Middle East, Mani was depicted as Jesus Christ. In China, the Buddha, uh, and just uh, wherever they went, they just adapted the local custom. It's part of the reason probably why they eventually uh, sort of disintegrated. But this is an example of syncretism when you have um, two ideas coming together and having something new come out of it, which is this dualistic religion of the Silk Road. And so in addition to Christianity and Buddhism being spread along the Silk Road, you also have the spread of Islam along the Silk Road. And you can see the area here in orange, which is the uh, extent of Islam around the year 1000. And you can see it overlapping with all of these trade routes. And this is because Islam was very famous for spreading along trade routes. And while uh, trade routes did play a big part of it, uh, it's worth noting that a lot of the early military victories, especially the military victories and the conquest of the Silk Road cities, uh, really did promote this idea that Islam might be the right religion. Sufis, who are religious mystics that are not so concerned with a lot of the strict rules of, of their religion, often convince many people to join their religion. This could often take the form of some sort of blending of local customs. And it's worth noting that Islam may have conquered Central Asia, but Central Asians would play a huge role 
uh, in the history of Islam. So Islam may have conquered all the Silk Road cities, but the peoples living there, uh, specifically the Turkic peoples uh, and the Persian speaking peoples would play a huge role in the history of Islam. So for example, the Abbasid revolution, which was the second caliphate that overthrew the Umayyad caliphate, that was launched essentially from Central Asia. Persian speaking people from Central Asia moved into the Arab heartland and overthrew the Umayyad caliphate. Uh, and then the Turkic peoples who were initially those slave soldiers I mentioned earlier, they would go on to found many other uh, sultanates, such as the Fatimid Sultanate in Egypt that would convert most of the Egyptian population to, to Islam, as well as the uh, Delhi Sultanate, which would effectively entrench Islam and make it part of what is now Northern India and Pakistan. So it's worth noting Islam may have conquered the Silk Road, but the Silk Road in turn kind of came back and shaped Islam in many ways. And of course, you have the Mongols. Now, this is a really interesting series of paintings because the Mongols were known to be very tolerant. They kind of let anybody uh, worship their religion as long as they acknowledge the Mongol Khan as leader of the community. So in both of these images, you have leaders of the Ilkhanate, that's the Mongol kingdom of Persia, being depicted in the texts of different religious traditions. So for example, here we have the Mongol ruler Helugu and his wife, uh, who was actually Christian, being depicted as holding up one of the symbols of Christianity, so a sort of positive representation of these rulers. And then over here you have the Mongol leader of the Ilkhanate, Kazan, who would later actually convert to, to Islam, but you can see in here studying a Quran. So Mongol rulers, when they initially Actually, were done with their conquering phase, did tend to receive some positive uh, representation in their, in their local cultures. And this is in part due to the fact that they tended to tolerate local cultures, didn't insist on converting people. Let's talk about some art. Now, I could talk a lot about art on the Silk Road, um, but I really just want to talk honestly about this one piece of art that I really like. So this is a wall tile from a palace in what is now... Uh, I believe it's now in Azerbaijan. So this is a palace from the Mongol period. And I just think this is amazing because here you have the imperial dragon uh, and then you have this Islamic symbol that it's encased in. So in particular, the Rub al-Hizb uh, is an Islamic symbol representing two overlapping squares. This is common in Islamic artwork. And then you have the Azure dragon right, the traditional symbol of Chinese imperial power. So you have sort of a fusion of these two in just what may be the coolest piece of uh, ceramic work I think I've ever seen. All right, so we've talked a little bit about diasporas before, that is culture being spread along the Silk Road. We've talked about religion. What about talk about ethnic groups, right? And so we've already hinted at some of these, right? You have your merchant communities, people who travel to different places to do business, such as the Sogdians in China, but also, for example, the Chinese and Samarkand. Uh, who moved there and may have contributed to the silk industry. There's kind of some debate about that. But you also have refugees and migrants. So for example, Nestorian Christians who are escaping persecution in the Eastern Roman Empire, and the Jews escaping uh, Roman persecution and the destruction of the temple. So for example, the Jewish community in Balkh, which is the city in Afghanistan, was a major Jewish center for a very long time. In fact, it's even said that two Jewish prophets, um, Ezekiel and Isaiah, might even be buried there, although there's no proof of this. So the point is there were many uh, communities that were established by people people fleeing persecution. They were also administrators and soldiers, so Persians who were working uh, in Yuan, China, in the court of the Khan, uh, as well as Chinese engineers who helped the Mongols destroy the walls of Baghdad and conquer the city. And there's also the famous case of Marco Polo, who you might have heard of, traveled from Venice in Europe all the way to China. According to him, he got a job working for the Khan in China and worked there for, I think, 15 years. Now, there are some holes in his story, and some people don't think he ever traveled to China at all, although I don't know if that's true. But it was not unheard of for the Mongols to employ uh, foreigners in their administration, so it's entirely possible he might have gone there. There's just some inconsistency in some of his writing, so there's a bit of a debate among the academics as to whether he actually did make it all the way to China. And part of the reason is because no Chinese sources ever actually talk about Marco Polo. So it's kind of like, ooh, he said, she said situation. Now, one actually, one interesting thing about the, I mentioned the Jewish community at Balkh. Um, this is really interesting because, so Afghanistan, uh, in the, at the turn of the 20th century, so in 1900, Afghanistan had about, I think, 5,000 Jewish families. So perhaps like uh, 10,000 to 20,000 Jews living in Afghanistan in the uh, beginning of the 20th century. As of 2000, there were two, two, I don't mean 2000, I mean two, Jewish people living in Afghanistan. Uh, they were native Afghans who were part of the community there, uh, but they had not left. Their families had all left. They'd moved to the United States or Canada or Israel, uh, but those two uh, opted to remain uh, in part because they were native Afghans. They felt no need to leave. Uh, and then one of them eventually did move to Israel, which meant that there was only a single Jew left in Afghanistan for the last 15 years. And on September 7th, 2021, in the face of the Taliban offensive towards, uh, towards Kabul, this one Jew uh, 
took his family, uh, took many of his uh, people he was friends with, and they left. Where they went has not been disclosed. Uh, but as of you know this year, as of September of this year, 2021, there are no longer any Jews living in Afghanistan, or at least not that anybody knows of. And so you know, I, th I think that is a tragedy, uh, in part because I'm always a little bit sad when a country loses uh, some unique element of its culture. Uh, but this has happened historically to other uh, diasporic groups. For example, the Sogdians, uh, they gradually kind of blended in and faded away as an independent group, although their name survives in some places. And let's talk a little bit about the travelers on the Silk Road. Now, I did mention Xuanzang, who was the Buddhist monk who traveled overland from China and into India, and then back to China through the sea. And his goal was primarily to get Buddhist texts. Now, Ibn Battuta is another traveler who's very famous. Now, Ibn Battuta is perhaps considered the most traveled person in human history before the invention of the steam engine. So he either walked, rode, or sailed something like 73,000 miles in his lifetime, including on parts of the Silk Road. Um, now, he undertook this journey originally as part of the Hajj, which is the Muslim obligatory pilgrimage. This was another use for the Silk Road, was Muslims in Central Asia would take the Silk Road to try to get to Mecca for their Hajj. Um, but he then went on a series of other adventures. He went to India, then he went to Southeast Asia, then he went to China, then he came back and he went to Africa. And he wrote all this down in a, in a travel log, which is a really fascinating read if you ever get the chance to read it. Um, and he almost never left the Islamic world. It was incredible, uh, all the things he wrote about and discussed. And here you can see a group of pilgrims going on the Hajj. Here are two maps. Uh, on the right here, you see uh, the map of Ibn Battuta's journey. So he starts from his native North Africa, and then he continues in, and he does his, his pilgrimage in Mecca. And then he goes to the Delhi Sultanate, where he gets a job as a judge. And he comes down here to the Maldives, where he gets another job as a judge, goes over to Southeast Asia, stays here for a little while, goes up to China, uh, officially on business from the Delhi Sultan, stays there for a while, uh, then crosses back, sails back, goes through Delhi, goes up into uh, sort of the Golden Horde, the Russian part of the Mongol Empire, uh, and then comes back down into um, the Middle East and over into uh, North, back into North Africa. And then he actually, you can't see it, he goes down into West Africa where Islam had spread at this time. So he almost never left the Islamic world. And his the fact that he almost never left the Islamic world is a testament to the fact that Islam had spread so far from its native uh, start in Arabia. Then you have kind of Zhuangzong's journey here. So he starts in Chang'an and he then goes through the Taklamaka Desert over the Pamir Mountains and down into India where he studies for I think 10 years, going around, gathering texts, collecting ideas, visiting temples, and then he goes back up and over the uh, over the mountains again and around the Taklamakan Desert back to uh, Chang'an. And so, you know, again, these, the fact that uh, these people could travel so far, and no matter where he was, including Samarkand, uh, Duan Hong, uh, in parts of what is now Afghanistan, there were Buddhist temples everywhere he went. He was never, so to speak, outside the reach of a Buddhist uh, temple or a Buddhist region. So, again, these travelers testify to the extent in which Buddhism spread along the Silk Road. We talk about cultures moving around and changing, like it's always a good thing. And I do generally in my 21st century mindset do think it's a good thing. However, diasporic communities could be targets of uh, the resentment of other local populations, especially in times of turmoil and uncertainty. So for example, as Mongol rule declined across Eurasia, Mongols tended to be the victims of widespread massacres, uh, especially in China once the Yuan dynasty fell. But even before the fall of the Yuan dynasty, as it was weakening, uh, the ruling Mongols attempted to target foreigners uh, um, as a way to try to stabilize their rule. So in Quanzhou, which was the city that Marco Polo sailed out of, in 1366, there was a massacre of the local Muslim population after a minor revolt. And Tamerlane, the great conqueror I mentioned earlier, is usually considered to be responsible for the complete destruction of the Nestorian Christian church. There were something like 200 Nestorian communities before his conquest, and after his conquest, there were seven communities. And so the targeting of smaller cultural groups, either in times of instability or in part in the name of empire building, uh, meant that sometimes these diaspora communities were convenient targets. All right, let's talk economics. Now, we've been talking about trade for a very long time. Uh, but one of the things that the College Board especially emphasizes is the, the intensification of trade, right? So for the AP World course, it is 1200 to 1450. Right. And so the the trade routes had, as you probably by now realize, existed long before that. But what was it about 1200 to 1450 that saw the increase in trade, the intensification, more trade, more goods being spread everywhere? Well, part of it was the fact that there were just more people demanding more goods, uh, more elites, more uh more merchants, uh, a general increase in wealth across Afro-Eurasia. And so with the general increase in wealth uh, came the general increase in demand for uh, 
for goods. And so here you can see the production of wool in Europe. Uh, this is part of a text that uh, described new wool making procedures, uh, as well as here is a production of cloth to make textiles. Textiles were a major, major part of the trade ac across the Silk Road. But some resources that were traded uh, much more intensely than they had before might be precious stones, wool, spices, textiles, as well as iron and porcelain production. And we haven't talked about silk, but we will, I promise. Now, part of the reason that um, that this trade could intensify was because there was new technology to make it possible, in particular iron, which wasn't traded as much as other luxury goods, uh, but was nonetheless traded in an increased amount. This, this increase was made possible because of some new iron making techniques that were popular in the Song Dynasty in China, which is essentially the fact that they were able to burn off more of the impurities in the iron, in part because they could get it hotter, in part because they started using coke, which is essentially charcoal that's been burned over one time. And the fact that they could produce all this iron with less work meant that workers are free to work on other things like silk or porcelain or painting or whatever else it is that they wanted to work on. Not only did China supply perhaps 50% of the world's iron in the first millennium, but they were also supplying a great deal of its silk and its other luxury goods. China at this time may have represented 30 to 40 percent of the entire world's gdp and so in general uh it's just keeping in mind that technology uh for iron production for silk production uh really contributed to this increase in trade now of course there's also these trade practices and sometimes this is referred to as commercial practices but as more merchants began to do more trade and more places um merchant groups popped up and newer practices that were designed to sort of promote trade or at the least make it a little less risky so more people would do it uh, began to emerge. So for example, some merchant groups are there to distribute risk, that is make it so that you didn't lose everything if one venture went bad. So Kardimis uh, in the Islamic world were a were, a, uh, were organizations in which merchants would go in together on a venture and everybody would supply a little bit of the money and that way nobody lost anything if uh, things went bad. You also had bills of exchange and credit, uh, which basically meant that you could essentially um, put your money somewhere and somebody would give you a note saying you have this much money and then you could take that money somewhere else uh, and then show them the note and say, look, I have this much money, uh, give me what I need. And so you weren't liable to be attacked by bandits, at least part of the way. Uh, and then that person could go get the money some other time. And so this had a couple different forms. In China, it was called flying cash. In the Islamic world, it was called kirad. But the fact that both of these parts of the world had some sort of credit system or, or, or bill of exchange was pretty darn impressive. You also had production guilds popping up in, in medieval Europe as well as in uh, medieval China uh, to try to control the quality and keep the price at a reasonable level to make sure that artisans could make a profit off their goods. Um, and then you also had banking institutions, uh, places where you could essentially store your money and understand that it would be safe. So for example, I mentioned earlier that temples became major lending institutions, as well as the Medici banks, which were some of the first banking establishments in Europe. Now, banking itself uh, is complicated, especially as this relates to religions. Um, for example, you know, Christianity and, and Judaism and Islam each have sort of slightly different interpretations on what it means to bank. But essentially, the, all these trade practices are just a further testament to the increasing number of merchants within their respective parts of the world and the increasing influence that merchants can have over local politics and local economies. So when talking about economics, we're also talking about trade practices. Now, of course, we couldn't talk about economics without talking about the rise of paper money, of which we see uh, during this time period in China and on the Silk Road, one of the first examples of widespread use of paper money. Now, that's not to say that there hadn't been alternatives to like silver and metal before. So for example, the Chinese would often pay their soldiers with silk from around 300 to the year 1000 CE, uh, especially their soldiers serving in outlying provinces would just be paid in silk and then they could take that silk, sell it to someone else. And this speaks to the fact that there was just a chronic shortage of coinage along the Silk Road, pretty much always. Coins would often be reused. Um, coins from one realm would be found in another realm. But this all sort of culminated in the ultimate, you know, alternative to coinage, which was paper money or known as jiaozi. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, which I believe it also means food, uh, was used in the late Song Dynasty, the Yuan Dynasty, and the Ilkhanate, which was another Mongol empire. So paper money was really a cross-empire um, phenomenon. It was used in Persia and China. And paper money had the effect of increasing trade because it's easier to carry paper, uh, and paper can be stored uh, more securely, potentially, than coins. Uh, but paper can also be counterfeited, like, like really badly. And so places that had paper money had the potential to see really high inflation, like the Song Dynasty and the Yuan Dynasty. And the Ilkhanate abandoned the practice after only three years because they saw how disastrous it was. Merchants didn't really want to accept paper money if they could avoid it. The point is, when talking about paper money, is that all the trade promoted 
uh, new innovative solutions to try to fix problems that, that would hinder trade, such as the fact that there was not enough coins and not enough metal in the Silk Road economies to keep the trade flowing. So they turned to things like paper money. All right, let's wrap things up by talking about a little bit of technology. Trade technology, that is uh, technology that makes trade either safer or increases the volume of trade, uh, have always been part of the Silk Road economies, uh, such as the wheel going all the way back to the wheel, which was developed somewhere in the area that would become the Silk Road, uh, definitely helped make definitely helped to make the uh, Silk Road possible. And again, the desire for the horse and the desire for chariots as well to go with the horse, uh, as can be seen in this Chinese uh, artwork from the Qin Dynasty, uh, was a big part of getting that Silk Road trade going in the first place. So other technologies such as the magnetic compass, the astrolabe and the camel saddle uh, became really big parts of the Silk Road because they increased the amount of goods that could be carried or they increased the directional safety. Now, <clears throat> the magnetic compass is really interesting because we're not entirely, scholars aren't entirely sure if it actually traveled along the Silk Road. Marco Polo claimed that he brought one back, but that's never been substantiated. And I don't know, some simple Googling and, and JSTOR searching, I haven't been able to find any confirmation that the magnetic compass was on the Silk Road, but I may not be looking enough. It's entirely possible that it was. Um, and I think, honestly, on the AP exam, if you were to put that the magnetic compass on the Silk Road, you'd probably be fine. It wouldn't be an issue. Um, so yeah, these are just some of the basic trade technologies you, sh you should know about. Now I want to talk about some other really interesting stuff, such as imitation goods. Uh, one of the facts of the Silk Road is, especially between uh, the Chinese world and the Islamic world, was that goods were exchanged so heavily, you began to see goods sort of uh, duplicating one another. So for example, this uh, metal candle holder uh, from what is now Iran, um, and this particular ceramic candle holder from Ming China is an example of possible duplication. Uh, and what makes this interesting is that this idea of a candle holder was not very common in China at the time. And so somebody created this borrowing this concept, or that's what scholars think. And so this, this is kind of showing that that high level of volume of trade led to sort of imitation goods, if you will, uh, not necessarily in a negative sense, like you're not like ripping it off. In fact, if anything, I would say you're making it better or putting your own spin on things, right? But technology, like cultures, like religions, can also blend and change a little bit as it goes place to place. So for example, this uh, silver canteen, which I talked about in another one of my videos called the Freyer Canteen, uh, finds its equal in this 15th century Ming ceramic canteen. Uh, and so again, just kind of see a, a little imitation Right, little, little borrowing of some of these um, some of these ideas and structures. But probably my most favorite, most interesting example of this is something called pseudo Kufic, uh, which is basically fake Arabic. Um, a lot of crusaders became familiar with Arabic, at least how it looked. And so a number of Renaissance artists actually attempted to put things that looked like Arabic in their paintings. So this is a painting of uh, the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus down here. But around the head of Mary, uh, there is writing that looks like Arabic, but it's actually not Arabic. It just looks like Arabic. Like probably the closest analogy I could give you would be if you've ever been to say China and you've seen a shirt written in English, um, it sometimes doesn't make any sense. It sometimes seems just like you threw a bunch of words on there in order to sell it or make it look cool. Uh, that's kind of what pseudo Kufic is, except in, in this case, you're not even making English words or you're just making like things that look like English letters, right? So this is probably the greatest example of like, ooh, let's copy that, right? Let's let's take that and take it back and put it in our stuff. I really find this just, just every time I see an example of this, I find it so fascinating. Um, as well as the spread of technology, the ability to produce technology also spread as well. So here you can see the spread of paper manufacturing. There's been a long held theory that paper manufacturing was spread from China to the Islamic world after the Islamic armies defeated the Chinese armies at the Battle of Talas uh, in Central Asia. They speculated that there might have been some prisoners of war from China uh, that, then, that then spread paper making to Samarkand and later to Baghdad. But scholars are now debating this a little more hotly that merchants themselves might have just brought paper and then it was imitated using local methods. Um, and we can see that in India, what is now India was already producing paper, but locally only in Buddhist monasteries, not like widespread across the region. There's also the interesting fact about silk production. I wanna really quickly tell you about three different forms of producing silk. Now in China, silk was produced by taking silk worms, feeding them mulberry leaves, and and then when they had spun a cocoon, you take the cocoon, you dip it in boiling water, which kills the larvae, uh, but then you can very slowly unspool the thread and you can run it through like a machine or you can weave it by hand, right? So that's how silk was made in China. And that was considered in the Middle Ages the best silk. But starting in the 700 CE, 
what is now Persia and the Islamic world began producing their own silk. But what they did is instead of uh, taking the larvae and dipping it in hot water, uh, they simply left the larvae out in the sun uh, to kind of cook essentially. Uh, and the, the larvae would essentially cook to death in its own cocoon, which also sounds pretty awful, quite frankly. But then you could uh, unwound, unwind the threads, or you could produce silk the way it was produced in India, uh, which was, I'm gonna call the humane method, uh, scholars believe in part because of Buddhism. Uh, in India, they simply let the silkworms grow their cocoon, uh, turn into a moth, and then burst out of the cocoon. Uh, and then they would collect the cocoon, sometimes from the wild, not even domesticated. And then they would take that silk and they would weave it into cloth. The problem with that is because the cocoon is broken, you don't get the really long, nice threads that you'd get in China. And so the, the silk from India was considered maybe like not the best silk, uh, but it was considered special because it was Buddhist silk. So um, for example, Xuanzang talked about the silk robes he got from Buddhist monks in India as being more uh, in keeping with his worldview than silk produced in India. It's worth noting that even when Buddhism spread to China, the people did not change the way they, they created silk. Even Chinese Buddhists continued to make silk by taking the larvae and dipping it in boiling water. So religion only has so much influence, it would appear. But that's the story of silk production. Um, there's also a couple of other things I'd like to touch on really quick, things like medical tech, mathematics, and military tech. So you may know Al-Khorazmi. Uh, he was a Persian mathematician. He did a lot of really cool things, but one of the coolest things he did is he popularized the use of Hindi numerals, that is the numbers zero through nine outside of South Asia, first bringing it to the Islamic world, and then it was spread from there to Europe. And the reason why it spread was not because it was some weird intellectual fad to study numbers. No, it was just more effective. It was easier for merchants to use these numerals than it was to use Roman numerals or an abacus, as you can see in this uh, medieval European uh, picture. It's showing that the person potentially using the what they called Arabic numerals is going a lot faster than the person trying to use the abacus, which is that weird counting thing. And so again, the, the, the desire to do business on the Silk Road, uh, once again, we're seeing the, the spread of some sort of particular technology. And of course, the Mongol Empire in particular, uh, we can hold responsible for spreading uh, some of this major, major technology. So for example, two concepts that the Mongols kind of brought together would be the Islamic concept of pulmonary circulation, uh, which the Islamic world pioneered, the idea that like your circulatory system uh, has a central engine in your heart. This fit really nicely uh, with the idea of pulse diagnosis, which was popular in India and China. That's the idea that you can tell a lot about yourself from your pulse, right? So you combine the pulse with a deeper explanation of how your blood circulates and you have um, a synthesis of medical knowledge there. Pulse diagnosis is still very popular in parts of Indian China to this day. And last but not least, we probably are gonna end this by talking about guns and firearms. So most of us are aware that in China, this is where gunpowder came from, specifically initially to make fireworks. Now the Chinese developed guns pre-Mongol conquest. We call them kind of hand cannons. Like you can see here on the right, it's a guy with a stick holding this kind of tube at the end. In the tube is some gunpowder. And then in the tube on top of the gunpowder is like an arrow, maybe a little piece of metal. Not quite what we would consider a gun today. Um, but the fact that the Mongols adopted this technology and then kind of took it with them throughout their conquests of Asia meant that it made its way uh, from China to the Middle East and later into Europe. In fact, it's believed by scholars that perhaps the Battle of Mohi in 1241 may have actually been like the moment when gunpowder technology was adopted into Europe. Um, because this was a battle in Europe with the Mongols on one side and local Hungarians on the other. And that after that battle, we begin to see uh, the development of gunpowder uh, in European uh, paintings and pictures. And then Europeans would go on to perfect it themselves in, for example, the Hundred Years War. And I've, I've made a video about that. You can feel free to check that out. So that was a lot. Let's take a breath. <clears throat> And I'm tired of talking. I hope you're not tired of listening. We're going to end with our learning objectives. So hopefully you were following along and maybe taking some notes. I know it was a lot, um, but if you are still confused about any of the learning objectives, here's the part where we're going to talk about our learning objectives. So learning objective number one, possible responses include the construction of caravanserais, banks and merchants associations, protections or tax breaks by local rulers, merchants donating to temples, which help them grow in financing centers, or the major trading cities such as Samarkand, Kashgar, and oh, look at that, I misspelled it. It's actually supposed to be Hangzhou with H with an A and then with an O at the end, or with an O before the U. That's my mistake. You know, so many slides, you can make one or two mistakes here or there. So that's some possible answers to learning objective number one. How about learning objective number two? Well, 
Possible responses include military technologies that may trade easier via large empires, those three technologies I mentioned earlier, paper money or other mediums to promote exchange, the diffusion of production methods to increase production overall, silk being a great example, and imitation goods that reflect the demand for luxury goods across regions, uh, the demand for exotic goods across regions, and hence imitation goods can be an example of that. Think about the pseudo kufic I mentioned earlier. All right, objective number three. Possible responses include the growth of major trading cities increased the demand for luxury goods. New classes of merchants often sought to display their wealth uh, and demanded such goods, such as exotic foods or luxury goods, silk and porcelain, tea or citrus, as well as more efficient methods of production, that is of silk and iron via the loom and the effective smelting I mentioned earlier with iron, meant that labor could be redirected to other luxury goods. All right, well, we're going to end there, and I want to... Thank you so much for joining me and thanks so much for sticking around. I know it was a lot. Um, yeah, but feel free to come back and visit at any time. Also, if you just like listening to me talk about history, I do have a Twitch channel where I periodically just talk about history while I get destroyed at Valorant or some other video game. Feel free to come by at any time, drop a question, drop a line. Um, yeah, thanks so much for joining me and I will see you next time.